perspective of members and believers, and of course, the exact and truth landscape of body fellowship believers across their fruity plain that fellowship with us, irrespective of where your membership lies. Welcome to our Exact and Truth Ministries Saturday Sabbath Facebook Live. I'm your host, Shepherd Solera R. Mann Jr., Exact and Truth Ministries in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where you bow your heads and pray with me at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that your mighty hand has made. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for food, shelter, and clothing. We thank you for protection and provisions with regards to our families, our loved ones, our children, our neighbors, co-workers, our friends, and even our enemies. We're asking that you come into this service this morning. We're asking that you have your way. We're asking that you move by your power and your spirit. We thank you. We're asking, Heavenly Father, that you order our steps, and we're asking that you send your word, and we're asking that as we incline our ears this morning, you administer grace to every hearer and you allow us to leave the better for coming no longer the same. We thank you for your mercy and your grace with regards to life, health, and wealth. We're asking uh, that you continue to cover us and keep us. We thank you for allowing us to enter into this new year. We know that you have given us uh, the ability to be able to persevere despite what we faced in the last several years. And Heavenly Father, we're grateful. We're asking that you receive our posture of worship, the way that we present ourselves to you. We're asking that you receive our praise, our prayer, and our fellowship, and that you dwell among us and amidst us. Heavenly Father, we're asking right now, and we call out the names of individuals that constantly solicit prayer that on our prayer list. We thank you for uh, what you've done for our very own Auntie Ethel Felton, continue to keep her, and we're asking that you give her uh, health and that uh, you restore her uh, body. We're asking that uh, you continue to inspire uh, the understanding and uh, the mind and bring full health and wellness. We're asking that you do the same for Landscape Sister, Sister Brittany Newday. Remember, uh, Miss Tamu, good friend of our very own brother Chris McGraw. We're asking that you remember brother Ron Goodrich and his health right now, brother Barry Chambers and his health right now, Heavenly Father. We're asking that uh, you remember mom uh, Diana Mann and her health, uh, mom Nandale Smith and her health, Heavenly Father. We thank you for uh, those that operate in the gift of helps and uh, those who are caretakers for so many. Remember uh, precious Auntie Maggie Johnson this morning. We thank you for uh, Bishop Solera Armand Sr., uh, our ministry uh, founder and shepherd emeritus. And we're asking that you continue to strengthen him and give him the wherewithal uh, as uh, he uh, helps even uh, precious mom Diana. We're asking that you remember Sister Joanne Griffith, our precious mother-in-law today, even with regards to the role that she plays in assisting her sister, Aunt, Auntie uh, Ethel Felton. And, you know, Lord, those uh, are names that are on our list. And Heavenly Father, we're asking right now that uh, you remember them, those names that we may have not called, all those that are infirm. We know that Landscape Sister, Sister uh, Nadina Brown of Macedonia, Missionary Baptist Church, her and Deacon Brown uh, are in uh, the process of seeing about Deacon Brown's uh, mother who has been hospitalized. We're asking that you remember that circumstance and have your way, Heavenly Father, and just all those that seek and solicit prayer. We believe that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avail of much, and that's why we take out the time to pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we're asking that you send your word. We're asking that you strengthen our own body and uh, that you give us uh, the reticence and the sustenance uh, in, uh, that will enable us to be able to continue to do your will and to allow the glory of your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Remember our very own minister of music, uh, Mark Davis, and uh, his health and well-being, welfare, strengthen and encourage him and uh, so that he can continue to be utilized for your will and purpose. And we ask these blessings and many more. Remember those that need remembering, we say, before we conclude this prayer at Exact the Truth Ministries, those who uh, may have become fearful, skeptical, unbelieving, may be decompressing from the faith because of man's sacrilege and dogma and hypocrisy and just aberrant walk with regards to the orthodoxy of your scripture and your way. We pray that we do not blame you for what mankind has done. And we ask these blessings and many more once again 
in that great name, Yeshua, Yehoshua, Hamashiach, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, Shabbat Shalom, Exactly Truth Body Fellowship members and the landscape. It's a blessing to be alive and we're grateful for the faithful this morning. So grateful for each and every one of you. And uh, I'm grateful to be alive. We made it over. We made it over. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Praise the Most High. Uh, am I correct in the fact that this is our first live and Saturday Sabbath Facebook streaming of the new year. I believe that I am. And so uh, welcome each and every one of you all who uh, is fellowshipping with us this morning. We don't take it for granted waking up this morning early to meet us in Saturday, Saturday, Sabbath, Saturday, 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 Shabbat Shalom and a blessed day of rest to each and every one of you all. And we're grateful that you're here to fellowship with us. You can be anywhere, but you're here with us right now. And uh, so we're grateful and uh, we're just grateful for the wonderful conference that we had on Wednesday in our uh, exacting insight into the word Wednesday Bible study and Facebook live. We always have a blessed time. The Heavenly Father meets us there. And listen, if you've failed to make it out, you have got to make it out, beloved. You've got to meet us there. We have a wonderful time in question and answer coming together as a fellowship and the insight that he gives us in the word, uh, one towards another and expressions. It's just a blessing. And uh, listen, every Wednesday, every Wednesday at 730 at the Swatera Church of God shared ministry that we share with Swatera Church of God there and uh, with New Beginnings Ministry. We're just so grateful for those who are able to make it out. And you're going to want to put it on your schedule to be there. Listen, we're praying for you all. We want you all to keep us in prayer continually. For we need your prayers, and we're grateful for them. And we're looking forward to prosperity and sustenance, both mind, body, soul, and spirit. Prosperity, beloved, is so much more than just financial. And we're looking for the Most High to continue to sustain us. Uh, and uh, we appreciate the advantage of prophecy. If you did not peruse the message last week, giving us prophetic forecasts with regards to 2023, you're going to want to go back and you're going to want uh, to watch that and binge all of the messages that you missed for they have purpose and direction for our lives. Amen. Well, we've got a slate of things on schedule that we have to attend to for Saturday, but none of which is more important than uh, the conveying and the pouring, outpouring of the word that the Most High, the Holy Spirit has poured into us for you. So we're going to do that. On Saturday Sabbath, you all know the tradition in Exact Truth Ministries. We lift up the Holy Writ. Why? Because it contains words of the Most High, words that were left on record for our learning. So where you are lifted up, we lift it up. And uh, we lift it up symbolically and look up to it because we don't want to look down to our own understanding. Scripture says we ought to look into the hills from which cometh our help, our help coming from the Most High, which has made the heavens and the earth. So that's what we do. And uh, we're grateful, beloved. We're going to ask you at this period of time, give me a moment here because uh, I erroneously cleared out the scripture we had pulled up on our device in order to read the English Standard Version of what we're going to read. Meet us in the Hebrew book of Psalm, chapter 119. We're going to be reading verses 41 through 50. And if you have the capability, please join us. We're going to be referencing the English Standard Version of the English Translation of Psalm 119 and chapter 119, verses 41 through 50. Before we read out of the Holy Writ as a foundational basis of our text this morning, how are y'all doing? Happy New Year once again. Glad that you made it over. Hopefully you're blessed. And we pray that you're in good health. So many people are enduring and suffering different maladies. And just know, beloved, that you're on our hearts and that we're praying for you once again. All right. Herein is the reading, beloved, of the Holy Writ. And it reads as thus. Psalm chapter 
119, verses 41 through 50. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, wow, which I love, and I will meditate on your statues. 49, remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. And finally, and very key this morning, beloved, to our text, this is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. I'm gonna repeat that for those of you all who are in the back. This is my comfort in my affliction, the psalmist writes, that your promise gives me life. Amen, amen. May the Most High add a blessing and an enriching to the reading out of the Holy Writ this morning and for the time and the duration of the time that is allotted to me to speak to you all this morning. Beloved, the title of our text is simply titled Properly Navigating Through Affliction. Beloved, I personally have found myself pondering the meaning and purpose for the sustained and lingering health issues and minor afflictions that I've endured myself pretty much since the start of 2022. As the year has changed from 2022 into this new dawning of 2023, I found myself this week sitting back and still having minor residual cough and you know some mucus and things of that nature, you know, that we're not complaining. Listen, there's so many people that have fared so much worse than Shepherd Man, but yet and still, we know that afflictions are relative. Oftentimes, when you suffer from a hangnail, you ain't thinking about who got cancer. And so we found ourselves praying in, in a meditative state this week and just contemplating, Heavenly Father, honestly, how long am I going to have to endure these little, uh, you know, neg uh minor and, and just irritating maladies that seem to persist and yeah, just, you know, get in your way of just getting out and just running and attacking your regimen as usual and normal and just become, um, if you let it, it can, can just become, you know, just discouraging and things of that nature. So I, I was pondering it this week and found myself pondering it and praise the most high living my life with loved ones that have endured lifelong maladies and health issues. I believe that helps me keep my relative and relatively minor afflictions in proper perspective. Yet and still, if we're being honest, it, it can be disheartening at times, you know, it can become quite taxing and, as we aforementioned, discouraging with illness and, dare I say, a bad luck. You know, not that we're dealing in luck and things of that nature, beloved, but just as a way of forming it in a simple way so that we can understand together where we're coming from. You know, when you're dealing 
tacitly with ongoing, aggravating uh, systemic illness and people encounter what they call bad luck, as it were, whether it be with your health or in some other uh, manner or form of something that befalls us. It can be quite taxing to the soul and spirit. One of the greatest struggles that a believer will encounter is the ras rationalization of their affliction beyond its origin being viewed as anything other than solely punitive from their point of view. Or in simpler terms, being afflicted or bearing affliction as punishment for some wrongdoing. It's difficult for people to go beyond that, even when we're dealing with insecurity and so we don't want anyone to see a sweat, as it were. Oftentimes, deep down inside, that is still what is going on in our psyche, and that is how we're viewing and reading things inwardly, even if we don't express that outwardly, is that somehow what I'm enduring with regards to this infliction has to be some type of punishment for something that I've done wrong. Human beings have a propensity or a tendency to be rather one dimensional when it comes to discerning or judging the reason or causation of a particular affliction because we tend uh, to view being afflicted in a singular way. Once again, as some type of punishment or as some type of punitive measure or response in retaliation for some degree of misstep or for some wrong decision. When I was coming up in uh, the neoclassical Pentecostal denomination, not to speak disparaging of those individuals, but just speaking uh, of my and from my experience, it didn't seem like a week passed before somebody was willing to just speak some type of omen with regards to viewing a person's outcome or what they were dealing with and uh, just casting aspersions and judgment on that individual and connecting it to some type of misstep and almost as if, you know, you deserve everything you're getting and that you're suffering because of, you know, what you've done. And once again, we're not, if you allow me to just be less technical and just speak honestly and, and just speak freely from my heart because once again, you know, we can relate directly with what we're talking about. And, you know, I don't want you to get depressed and don't, this ain't for me. Don't tune off because we're going somewhere. You're going to want to hear the whole of this matter. And I know so many people can relate where we're coming from. You know, don't get me wrong though. You know, once again, there are circumstances where uh, direct actions and deeds warrant a certain penalty and suffering, but beloved, that's only one way of looking at this thing. And of course, it is important that we keep our heads up, that we square our shoulders and that we are affirmed in the salvation that the Most High has given us because we have a job to do as lights of this world, as literal billboards and advertisements of his grace and salvation. And so it is important for us to be able to properly discern because we've got to stay in the fight. We've got to stay in this game. And it is the objective and the priority of our adversary, Ha Satan, how Satan would love for us to be one dimensional and uh, to be over overcome with even incorrect perspective, because if you don't have proper perspective, then you're not going to have correct outcome. While in many instances, that very well may be accurate that we've lived in a manner where some things we brought upon ourselves, it doesn't constitute or completely represent the various other explanations for why believers find themselves living with and enduring substantial affliction while in the flesh. It was clearly the belief of King David, for example, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all, which is what King David wrote in Psalm chapter 34, verse 19. Let's say that again, beloved. That's amazing. That's remarkable. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
We don't often connect righteous living with affliction. Yet so many of us today in the landscape, so many of you all who are watching this or people who are, are going to eventually view this sermon and lesson, you know that your attempts to walk circumspect are before the eyes of the Most High. You know your efforts with regards to living circumspect and trying to be faithful as you know how, yet you have happened upon affliction. Some of us, many, some more intense than others. But yet David's outlook was, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So what are we to do with this? How often do we sit with that verse and really ponder the meaning of this? King David was the chosen of the Most High. Through his lineage, he sent the Hamashiach. Yet David's outlook was, despite how righteous you live, your afflictions are many. How many of us want to absorb that in this day and time and really, really contemplate and deal with that being a reality because as we once again aforementioned prior in our lesson just this morning we don't often view righteousness and connect that directly with affliction we connect oftentimes affliction as bad luck or an omen of some matter i believe that this is a topic that needs to be broached because i believe whether we ponder it properly or not is something that Many of us, if not most of us, have gone through, are going through, or will go through. So David articulating that the righteous would suffer and endure many afflictions, not just the disobedient or those whose thoughts and deeds would be judged as wicked. The righteous, beloved, that's profound. The expanses of denominational dogmatic teachings in this day and age has made it nearly incomprehensible for most folk to understand what David was talking about. The original Hebrew word that represents the English term affliction in Psalm chapter 34, verse 19, for example, is the lowercase ra, which means adversity. This is interesting. The literal meaning of the lowercase ra is disagreeable or unpleasing in the eyes of. That's what it means literally. This understanding alone should enable us to expand our purview of what we consider afflictions to be, beloved. Now, let us do this. Just insert the etymology, the Hebrew term Ra, into verse 19 of Psalm chapter 34, and voila. It opens up a completely new understanding of this particular verse. Now, let's do it. Many are the things found to be disagreeable <laughs> and viewed as unpleasing in the eyes of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Which is why nothing can nor should be more vital and paramount in the life of a believer than the proper exegesis, for example, of the words that were left on record for our learning. Beloved, the disagreeable and unpleasing circumstances that we find ourselves in and or encounter as well as the afflictions that we suffer in our flesh often serve a variety of purposes regarding life and faith walk. They're not just punitive. It's not just punishment. Whether those vital purposes represent refinement of our character and spirit to soul interface, as it were, or whether our affliction is designated to instruct us lessons that are vital that we learn or even to redirect our path. Afflicted on this path, we change course and direction and it actually leads to our destined purpose so that we may avoid greater affliction or even destruction further down the path that we are on. Affliction has a multifaceted purpose and use. Yeah, I don't like it. I understand it, it doesn't seem pleasant for the time or the season, but it's important for us to be able to properly, properly discern what its meaning is and what it's for. Affliction can and does often serve multifaceted roles and objectives in the lives of believers. And this is one of the reasons why King David said that in the life of the righteous, the afflictions will be many because affliction is not 
simply a malady in our flesh. It can be a thorn in our side. It could be a lesson that we need to learn. Affliction can and does serve multifaceted roles and should never be simply relegated to the conclusion that their assignment to whoever is suffering through affliction is simply punitive in origin and reasoning. Afflictions also are often self-imposed based upon the Hebrew definition and etymology of the lowercase ra, which oftentimes entails our outlook on a circumstance that has befallen us. Afflictions are often self-imposed due to the poor attitudes and negative or ominous outlook we impose on what we encounter or face on our life journey. The Most High can explain, for example, sometimes why we're going into a certain scenario, why we're being tested, why we're going into a trial. Because if you're a messenger and if you were called and elected of the Most High, Scripture says that he will not send you with purpose absent of understanding. That's the word. So uh, oftentimes, like for example, take for example, Jonah. He'll explain what the task is and our overall outlook on what it is that he has called and commissioned us to do will cause us to label an assignment as an affliction. We've got to be careful when we're being assigned the task or sent into a circumstance or scenario equipped with his power, but yet and still suffering may be involved in that task and we mischaracterize or mislabel a task and an assignment as an affliction because the way that we view something has everything to do with how we're going to endure it and what the outcome is going to be. And how we endure it is going to literally determine the outcome. Because if we tell ourselves the whole time, I don't know if I can endure this, will your outcome be one of an overcomer? It's food for thought. So in many cases, the believer is wondering why a particular affliction has befallen them. All the while, our Heavenly Father is perplexed as to why we're labeling a particular test trial or reordering of our steps for our own benefit. He's actually showing love, grace, and mercy, but we're calling it an affliction out of misunderstanding or out of a myopic sense of uniformity where we only view these things one way. And the crazy thing, beloved, is much to the delight of Ha Satan, the accuser of the brethren, our adversary, we often fail to directly communicate and inquire of the Lord as of what the proper and precise explanation is for why we're experiencing or encountering what we're experiencing. So on top of everything, we just label our afflictions and don't even bother to ask the Most High, what is this or why I'm dealing with this? Which is why so many of y'all, are you discouraged, shepherd man, or you know, you shouldn't be discouraged. Some of y'all have an, an admonishing tone with regards to shepherd man. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? I'm, I'm not saying anything negative. I love her, but I can hear Auntie Maggie now. Are you reading the books, shepherd man? Are you juicing? Are you doing what you're supposed to? You know, why are you feeling bad? Listen, one of the reasons why I was pondering was not because of just sheer discouragement, but that's who we should go to. We should go to the Father and we should inquire. This thing seems to be persisting. What is it? Now, if you end up dealing like what Paul dealt with <laughs> when he was writing the epistle and he said, uh, three times I besought the Most High to move this thorn in my side and the, and, and the Holy Spirit said, I'm not going to move it. And then he said, I, I'd rather take pleasure in this affliction and, uh, you know, my str your strength is made perfect in weakness and that your grace is sufficient for me, the Most High is telling him, you know, how many of us are going to have that conclusion that Paul had, though, with regards to what is afflicting us? But some of us don't even get to where, that's what Shepherd Man's point is, we don't even get to where Paul got to, where he inquired of the Most High. What's this affliction to my side, and will you take it from me? We, we skip a step. We go straight from 
being assigned, afflicted, or whatever the designation is, right to despair, skipping a stage, much to the delight once again of how Satan, of asking the Most High. Scripture says, ask what you will in my name. It shall be granted unto you. Don't even bother to take out the time. And then if you do answer, you don't have patience to receive the answer. This is why nothing can nor should be more vital and paramount in the life of a believer, not only then properly understanding the word, but also as well the direct communication with the Father. Beloved, it is imperative that you do not cease in your communication with the Father, whether that be in prayer. Well, when I pray to him, he don't always talk back to me. Am I supposed to be like a phone call? Am I supposed to receive a text answering my prayer? He answers us through circumstances. He answers us through the word. That's why it's important for us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as the matter of some do. He answers us in so many different measures according to the word. But we've got to be patient and we've got uh, to stand ready, waiting. We can't abandon our own inquiry after we've inquired. It's imperative that our communication with the Father continue so that we can properly discern what we're in. When communication becomes stagnant or somehow severed between a believer and their Heavenly Father, it becomes virtually impossible to navigate one's direction. The GPS is down. <laughs> And we're a long way from the time where people uh, circumnavigated their lives with maps and such. I'm using this as a metaphor, but it's a good one. You all understand where I'm coming from, particularly some of us that struggle to pay attention to the GPS, even when the GPS is telling us where to go. Yes, communication becomes stagnant or somehow severed between the believer and the Heavenly Father. It becomes virtually impossible to navigate one's direction in light of the countless snares and pitfalls that lie in our respective paths, orchestrated by our adversary, I say. The devil's job becomes easier when we disconnect from the voice of the Father, which is why scripture verses such as Luke chapter 18, verse 1, prefacing the parable of the careless judge and the persistent widow. Peruse it in your own convenience. It's why the prefacing of this parable of which the Christ shared with his disciples for the purposes of understanding that men ought to always pray and not faint, or in other words, never grow weary of praying and communicating with the creator. This represents an example, this parable and this verse, men ought to always pray and not faint, coming from the Hamashiach, represents an example of how vital prayer and communication with the Heavenly Father is to our very survival and sustenance here on earth. We don't have direction. We don't know which way is proper if we do not communicate. Beloved, I'm almost done. The desperation to hear from the Lord and to receive his guidance for our direction so that our steps and choices may be ordered by him is no more apparent than in the case of Saul, king of Israel, when he sought counsel from the necromancer, someone that attempts to communicate with the dead, from when he sought an audience and counsel with the necromancer from Endor in 1 Samuel chapter 28 in an attempt to conjure up the spirit of the deceased priest and judge of the Most High Sabbath. Samuel was King Saul's link to the voice of the Almighty for most of the time that Saul was king and while Samuel was alive. And when that link was broken, when the Most High told King Saul through Samuel that I have taken your kingdom from you and given it to another. When that link was broken, beloved, the lack of guidance and direction and literally the silence emanating from heaven regarding Saul, who could normally get a word from the Most High, communicate through the priest Samuel on command. When that ended, beloved, literally the silence from heaven drove King Saul out of his natural mind. We cannot lose our means of communicating with the Father. We won't know what to call what we're going through. We, don't, we won't know what direction to take. And it doesn't have to stop us completely. 
oftentimes the slowing down of our purpose and our sojourn towards our purpose and our destiny. The slowing of it is enough to throw us off his clock because his clock never stops. His time never ceases. And it's enough for us to end up in very destructive constructs. So yeah, you don't have to come to a complete stop. Sometimes just pausing or slowing down your pace because of a lack of understanding is enough for us to fall into a snare that has been laid in our path by our adversary, I say. We cannot lose our means of communicating with the Father. We should not take for granted prayers that we send up. And we should not grow impatient with the machinations regarding how he is going to answer the prayers that we've solicited. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, help us because so many of us have come to our wits end with things that we're encountering. And it's done just that. It's, it's brought us to a pause, a dangerous pause. And I'm telling you, beloved, even with regards to our faith, and the speed in which the Most High goes to and fro and moves and his capability and his omniscience and his all power. Man, I'm telling you, it's difficult to hit a moving target. And that is why Satan is laughing because so many of us have become targets far easier to hit in recent days because of the slowing of our progress, because of the confusion regarding why we have and why we are enduring what has befallen us. Yet and still, as I close, I'm gonna explain one more passage of scripture because it's important for us to understand what King David was articulating when he said that many are the affliction of the righteous. Some of us feel like, man, you teach that scripture doesn't contradict itself. And when it does seem to contradict itself, then we need to dig deeper because it's something maybe we are not understanding. And I will reiterate that this morning. You can read a scripture like David's assertion, I believe in Psalm 34. And then you could recall the story of Abraham with regards to his nephew Lot and their predicament and the predicament that Lot and his family found himself in, uh, in the regions of Sodom and Gomorrah and the Most High sending his angelic messengers to destroy those cities and warn Abraham of his intent to do so. And then Abraham thinking of his family member, his nephew, uh, Lot and how he did not live in the manner in which the people and his neighbors surrounding him. And it kind of begs the question why you would choose to live in that environment in the first place. But he doesn't always assign us and send us in places of peace. The Most High doesn't always, well, hardly ever desires for us to minister or to preach to the choir, as it were, you know, that uh, adage that we find ourselves in in this day and time in a lot of the modern church <laughs> where we only minister to people that's agreeable, where our light is shining, uh, where light shine the brightest. Light refracts darkness. So oftentimes he's going to send us into darkness. How else is he going to deliver people who are his called and his chosen and his intent is to deliver them? We so busy condemning the world that we're supposed to be shining a light amidst more so than condemning them. That's not the role. He's the judge. Ultimately, if there's a condemnation of his life. And I'm not talking about compromising the gospel, but so far too often, that's why we're missing these generations that are upcoming because we too busy condemning folks rather than a light that shows them to the path of deliverance. So I digress, I'm sorry, you know, but I, I gotta be honest. Some of us, let's just be honest because that's what we do. We question, well, if Lot 
is to be uh, destroyed. I don't know how righteous he and his family may be living in those accommodations and choosing to live there. Why would you choose to live there? But we don't know where the most, it could, it could have been originally an affliction as it were. Because uh, once again, afflictions aren't always maladies of the flesh. That's a whole nother message. Some of us, he trying to send you somewhere. I'm not going there. You know what they're going to say about me and my family if I move to Sodom? All right, that's another word. However, let's go back to the context of what we were dealing with. On one end, David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. On the other end, Abraham is telling the Most High, is questioning him, is even, dare I say, challenging the Most High. You will not destroy the righteous with the wicked, will you? Now, we say that matter-of-factly when actually it is the conclusion of the exegesis that comes out of these verses that we're going to read. Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 through 25, the Most High Servant Abraham stated, and it states, Abraham drew near and said, Will thou, speaking to the Heavenly Father, also destroy the righteous with the wicked? See, we, we, we quote it a different way, but this is how it's phrased in Scripture. He phrased it, questioning and challenging the Most High. Listen, there are some righteous living people living in that area. Are they going to suffer the same affliction of the people that are living in violation to your will and to how you desire mankind to comport themselves, Heavenly Father? When I came up once again, this is another word that's going to be freeing for so many of you all. So many of these denominations are out here talking about don't question the Most High. Don't question the Most High God of the Hebrew when really leadership in your particular ministry or denomination don't want you to question them. Right here is an example of the messenger Abraham of the Most High challenging his heavenly father. Are you going to destroy? You won't destroy the righteous with the wicked, will you? Peradventure, the verse says, scripture says, there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein that be far from thee to do after this matter. Listen to Abraham challenging the Most High. He telling the Most High, it's beneath you if you had a colony, albeit a small one, of the righteous and that you would allow them to befall the same edict as those that are not righteous. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee? Shall not the, the judge of all the earth do right? Do right according to who? Do y'all hear the boldness that was in Abraham? Well, in my conclusion, <laughs> the Most High told him, listen, if you can find, <laughs> I can't take my glasses off of this, if you can find 50 people between those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's righteous, I'll spare the whole place. Come to find out, it was only Lot, his wife, and their daughters. That <sighs> For you Bible students out there and scholars, you know that Lot's wife, didn't survive the journey of escape. Partially because of how she perceived what afflicted her. Beloved, it's imperative that we properly navigate through the courses of these afflictions that have befallen us, that we ascertain what the purpose is. It's not time where whereas the Most High will not directly answer us concerning the outcome. Are we talking to the Father? There's great purpose oftentimes in what it is that we have to endure. Sometimes he utilizes how we go through particular afflictions themselves as a lesson and a light example and demonstration to not only bless, but to attract others. Why I got to go through and, and, and endure and suffer so that somebody else, listen, we're the light of the world. 
that don't always mean Nile laters and Starbursts and barbecue chicken and ribs. I don't know what y'all like. I, Kool Aid, whiskey. Which is why I was talking to the father this week with regards to, Lord, when my throat going to stop hurting? Lord, I tried so many things and my nose keep running. So I know some of y'all are like <laughs> to have those problems because you're dealing with real things. Some people may be viewing this from the hospital right now. We're not trying to make small or, or trivial the volume of what it is that you're enduring in comparison to Shepherd Man or someone else. I'm just saying it's important for all of us to properly ascertain why am I being afflicted and why does this affliction persist? And it's also important to ask because sometimes, once again, the Heavenly Father will show the way that you're viewing what you're going through is incorrect and being mislabeled as opposed to what it actually is or what his purpose is for what it is that you are navigating through or the trial or the test of the circumstance that you're enduring. All I know is without speaking with the father and him speaking back to us, we're lost. But it doesn't have to be so in many regards if we're faithful to prayer and patient in awaiting the answer and also in the proper position to receive the answer. Amen? So, just something that was on our heart, something that I know would reach and touch so many people because so many people, listen, they're going through and it's not going to be easy because your affliction is going to persist even beyond the explanations of this sermon. But I believe that this sermon has given great insight with regards to what is necessary and what it necessitates to properly and successfully navigate through the afflictions that we endure. Because yes, oftentimes as David aforementioned, they are many. Would you bow your heads and pray with me at this time as we close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom and for the insight that was shared in this word and in this lesson this morning. Uh, forgive us when our complaints are misdirected, uh, when our perceptions are misassigned, when we're just not in sync with the insight that you have provided so that we can be greatly successful in navigating, circumnavigating, and, and excellenting and perfecting our walk and our purpose that you have assigned us to. We believe and will never be remiss, Heavenly Father, to mention that we believe that forgiveness of our omissions, forgive us, forgiveness of uh, our missteps and mishaps, forgiveness of literal sin and iniquity and even deceit. We believe that all of these things and this forgiveness is nigh us because of the grace that comes due to the salvation you desire and that you have made available to us because of the sacrifice of your son, the Hamashiach, that died on the cross for us all. And all of us that believe, but didn't stay dead, praise the Most High, rose again, where currently is ascended to our Heavenly Father and is sitting on your right hand making intercession for each and every one of us, of which this message today is a powerful example of intercession so that we can understand what we're enduring. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray that through this grace afforded us, you allow us to be saved, or sozo, as is the original word for saved. In scriptures, for example, such as Romans chapter 10, verse 9, where Paul the Apostle is saying that if we believe that you the Hamashiach is the son of the Most High and has been raised from the dead that you will make us sozos, the Greek word that means that you will rescue us and preserves, preserve us until such a time that you return for us that we might live with you in infinite time. Heavenly Father, we ask these blessings and many more. Remember those names that we called out and the names that we did not call out, all those that solicit prayer. Remember those that are 
in the intrinsic center of their affliction and let them know that you're with them and that you're supping and dining with them and that they're not walking alone. And we ask these blessings and many more in that great name. Yeshua Yehoshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name we pray. Join us this Wednesday, 7.30 at Soteria Church of God for another Exacting Insight into the World Wednesday. And then join us again the following Saturday for another uh, Facebook Saturday Sabbath Live. At the end of this month, the last two Saturdays, we're going to be in person in person on our Saturday Sabbath for word, fellowship, worship, praise, song, deliverance. It's just going to be a wonderful time. Join us and meet us there. Until then, beloved, have a blessed Saturday Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom.